just going to kind of teach on a few things tonight. Uh, so just stay tuned and let's, let's get something. Amen. Amen. We'll talk about the things of God. Open our heart. Get some faith in us. And um, so let's read verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly. And the love of every one of you all abounds to each other. Uh, I want to talk about your faith growing. I think Joni's recently taught on this, uh, that your faith grows or the measure of your faith can grow. Did you just recently? For the women. For the women. <clears throat> so, as you know, everyone's been given a measure of faith. Everyone's been given some faith in them to get saved, to stay saved, to serve God, to do mighty things. He says your faith can grow exceedingly. Hallelujah. Your faith can grow exceedingly. Your faith can grow exceedingly. And so we need to make sure our faith is growing exceedingly. And to grow faith, number one, you need what? You need the Word of God because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So for your faith to grow for sure, you got to have, or for sure you got to have the Word of God. If you, want, if you want stronger faith, we could say, you've got to hear the Word of God. You've got to know the Word of God. Isn't that true? Yeah. You know, remember over in uh, Luke 17, the disciples asked Jesus, they said, increase our faith. And there's been so many Christians since then who have been praying that. Increase my faith, God. I just don't have strong faith. Increase my faith. But you can't do that. That's not really the way to do it. Now, you can ask the Lord to increase your faith, sure. But then there's more to it. Matter of fact, when the disciples asked Jesus to increase their faith, He didn't wave His magic wand. He didn't have one. He didn't bop them on the head with a faith stick. Right? What did He do? When they said increase our faith, He taught them something. So when you feel your faith is weak, you need to be taught or preached to or get back to the Word of God, or find some scriptures. You need the Bible to teach you. You need the God to speak to you. It's what you. If you want faith, you need God to speak, and for your heart to hear it. Amen. So they said, increase our faith. He said, if you had faith as a, as a grain of a mustard seed, you'd say to the sycamine tree, be removed and it'd be gone. Be plucked up and it'd go. Amen? Amen. And so he just said, if you had any faith whatsoever, which they do, you'd say something. So if you have faith, you'll say something. Amen. So if, if you have faith and don't say something, you're not exercising your faith. You're not using your faith. If you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you'd plant it. Does that make sense? You may feel like your faith is weak. You may feel like your faith is the size of a mustard seed, but that was the parable. No matter how insignificant your faith feels, you need to do something with it. If you had faith, you'd say something. So it doesn't matter how, because it always feels, in, your faith is almost always going to feel quite insignificant to the challenge. Till, till it's exercised. Till it grows exceedingly. Your faith is going to feel insignificant until you say something. See, that's going over like a lead balloon. You have to say what you believe, you have to target things, you have to command things, you have to get your word onto it, you have to, you have to believe that your words matter. You have to believe in the system of planting it into the kingdom of God. Plant the seed, it will grow. If you don't say something, it can't grow. If you had faith as a grain, do we need to go read that just in case? All right. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. We don't want to be found like Peter. Remember Peter saw Jesus walking on the water and the disciples were afraid. What did Jesus say? Peter said, if it's you, if it's you, Jesus, bid me to, if it's you, ask me to come out on the water. And so Jesus said, come, and so Peter did. He walked on water. He had to have faith to walk on water. It takes faith to do, him, do a miracle, doesn't it? Had to have some faith to walk on water. And then he was doing fine until he looked at the problem. He looked and saw the wind boisterous. 
and he began to sing. Jesus grabbed him, saved him, and said, what? Oh, you have little faith. Why'd you doubt? Oh, you have little faith. So you can have some faith. It could be little, though. Another time, the disciples were all scared because the, the boat was rocking. And he said, how is it that you have no faith? Isn't that right? So you can have no faith, you can have little faith, or you can have great faith. Remember he told that to the rich young, or no, to the uh, centurion? He said, I've not found so great faith, not in all Israel. So we, we need to grow our faith so that it's great. We can't live behind the coattails of all the other people. Amen. The days of the preacher being the great faith people is over, or the only great faith people. We, all, we need everybody to be a great faith person. Amen. Start with the little things in your life. Just be, begin to believe God for certain steps of life. All of your life needs to, basically we all need to learn how to believe God. How to exercise our faith. I believe, therefore, I do. I'm persuaded by the Word of God to live a certain way. You need faith to live right. Or to receive a promise from God, from the Bible. I found out that I'm not supposed to be sick. That Christians don't have to be sick. Huh! Takes faith to get there, doesn't it? What am I going to do with that truth? I've got to cultivate my faith. I've got to plant my faith. I've got to protect it. I've got to say it. I've got to believe it. I've got to water it. I've got to grow in this area. Amen? Amen. So I always say start with the headaches, move on into the fevers and whatever the, before you get the chronic thing or the terminal thing. So we need to grow in this area. All of us need to grow in this area. Because the promise is there. It's dangling from the tree. We just have to get it. And then you've got to be determined that it's mine. This is mine. This is my promise from God. I don't know about you, but God wrote this Bible for me. Oh, for him too. Oh, and him, her too. For you of you. God wrote this Bible for me. It's mine. It's his word to me. People say, I wish God talked to me. I just need God to speak a word to me. You got a word for me? Yeah, I do. We'll start you off in Matthew. How about that? <clears throat> I've said this before that people want a fresh word. They want a new word. They, they want you know, a spectacular word for their unique situation that they're in. And, you know, God, he doesn't have a problem talking to people. And, and he likes to lead people and speak to people and all that. But... I, I kind of realize that he's not too interested in telling you another thing if you're not interested in the things he's already said. He's already said thousands of things to us. If you're not interested in this, why would he want to tell you, you know, who to marry? Because that's important to me. Oh. <laughs> Hence the problem, right? Ooh, I'm already meddling tonight. <laughs> Praise God. So, he says, we're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it's fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abound towards each other. Hallelujah. Now, that's a statement that, you know, even a sinner could talk about. You know, you, we love each other, we love everybody, and we all, you know, kumbaya together. <laughs> I'm for world peace and everybody loving everybody, right? I'm sure there's a song in there somewhere. <laughs> but, you know... In the Lord, the love of God is the, is the pivotal or the, the, the crux of the whole matter. God is love. It's the, it's the crux of the whole matter. If you don't have, if you, get, you can have a bunch of faith, a bunch of everything else, but if you don't have love, you're basically pretty much nothing. Right? I mean, you can be famous and everything, but if you don't have love, heaven knows. Isn't that right? I mean, God keeps the books, doesn't he? He knows if you're walking in love with your fellow man. He, he knows if you love God and love your neighbor as yourself. So he keeps all the books on this anyway. And so when you realize that's the top thing, then that ought to, that ought to be the top paramount pursuit of every Christian is to, to tap into the God kind of love. Where it's none of me and all of him. Where I decrease, he increases. Where I'm not selfish, where I'm not self-centered, where I'm not thinking about me, where me doesn't even matter. Where your feelings don't matter. Should I meddle there for a while? Well, nobody's going to talk to me like that. 
now, now there's the problem. There's the problem. There's the problem. That type of, if you're a Christian and saying that thing, well, just don't let me hear you. God already knows he keeps the books, but that's, that's, sure fire, fire, that's sure evidence right there that you're not walking in love. You're too self-centered. Your, your me is too big. Your, your little eye should move out and big eye should move in. The I am should move in. You've got to move little eye out, though, before a big eye can come in. Well, I, I bet I know why they said that. I bet it's because... I better quit meddling there. <laughs> so our, our love ought to abound toward one another. We ought to have special love towards Christians. That's right. yep. Christians. I don't, I don't, you know, some people love their culture the best. Some people love their, you know, whatever group. You know, you find somebody likes your, your football team. And you know, oh, my gosh, oh, I do too, I do too. <laughs> we ought to have special love towards Christians. You find, somebody, find out somebody's a Christian, oh, special love. You're a Christian too? Now, I guarantee if you're excited about it, they're going to look at you funny. When I, when I first got in the kingdom, I thought it was going to be, you know, ticker tape parade. That everyone is like, Chas is in, he's in. And so when I met people, it was, I, I'm in. They're like, huh? Oh, good. Well, I've been in for 20 years. It's like, wait a second. I thought there's supposed to be special love here. You know, I'd be sharing Christ with strangers, even friends or strangers. Sharing the Lord or something and find out they're a Christian. Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, me too. Glory to God. Good to see you. They're like, <laughs> Jesus said you'd know the disciples by the love they have for one another. Being a Christian is supposed to be the most special thing in your life. A lot more special than your favorite football team. Isn't that right? But, you know, on the surface it's funny and you're getting it, you're understanding it on a surface level, but it takes a little effort to tap into this. In your own personal life, you've got to get with God and say, you know, I don't know what the preacher was talking about, all this liking Christians extra. I, just, I grew up Christian. I know, you know, that's all I've ever known. No, you don't. No, no. You should recognize the difference in the love of God versus every other love versus every other group versus any other thing. Your fraternity, your sorority, none of that means nothing. Anything. Nothing, none of that means anything. It should pale in comparison to the camaraderie you feel with Christians. That's why we have so much love. When we come to church, there's a spark between us because we've tapped in. Whether you knew it or not, you tapped into the real love of God, which is the most important thing. That's what's going to sustain you. That's, that's God. You're touching God. Every time you touch that love, every time you recognize, you're recognizing God. That is God. If Jesus, if Jesus were here, that's what He would be doing. He'd be greeting people. He'd be so happy to see everybody. Jesus wouldn't be in His office, you know, just... Come to me. I'm here. No, He'd be loving people and caring about people. Yeah! Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's right. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory to God. So anyway, our love's supposed to abound. I, I'm expecting our love to abound. If your love's abounding, you're getting closer to Jesus. If your love's abounding, you're experiencing God in this earth. People want to feel God, but well, you need some love. Because when you sense, when you start feeling the love of God pump through your veins, you are now contacting the living God. There's nothing better than that. Amen. 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 Verse 4, So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith. Hallelujah. I'm expecting that somebody's boasting about Houston Faith Church. Amen. It's okay to do that, not in a prideful sense, but you know, we ought to hear about each other. Don't you hear about certain churches doing big things for God? Isn't that kind of exciting? We ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith. Notice patience goes with faith. That's right. Amen. Faith is not walking around snapping your fingers and, and, and everything's just falling into place like this. You know, you're not 
the magician, um, you have to have some endurance. If everything you got was immediate, you wouldn't need any faith. Right? Now, you need to receive it immediately in the Spirit. You need your heart to latch onto it immediately. So you don't delay things. Well, I'll just be patient. No, that's not, not, that's not the type of patience he's talking about. He's talking about re- faith gets it now, and then you endure. Another word for patience in the New Testament is endurance. So patience, patiently endure would be a good way to say it. Grind it out. I've got it. I prayed, I received, I got it. Amen. That's how I got my wife. You heard the story? Okay. Seven years. I, I prayed, I received her, I had her. And then one year goes by, I got her. Glory to God. Two years, three years, four years. Praise the Lord, I got her. Everybody's wondering where she's at. <laughs> when are you getting married? I don't know, but I know I got a wife. I already asked. Got her. Been praising God for that for five years. Prayed five. I'd, I'd tell them, I'd calculate. I prayed three, four years ago, three and a half years ago, and received a wife. So I've got her. I just don't know where she's at. And then I don't even talk about it anymore. Praise the Lord. Then four years, five years, six years, seven years, seven years of just thanking God. Never re-prayed one time. Just endured right through it. Hallelujah. And then there she was sitting right in front of me. In church. In church. Through faith and through patience and faith and all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Let's talk about persecutions and tribulations. Everybody's favorite topic. (laughs) But, you know, part of the faith walk is persecutions and tribulations. Now, let's talk about those things, though, because I think the church has taken those words and basically stopped reading the Bible, said, oh, see there, you can expect a lot of tribulation, a lot of persecution. Well, truthfully, most of you don't get much persecution for your faith. Persecution refers to people. The word in the Greek refers to people being involved in your suffering. Okay? And particularly for your faith. In the scriptures, in the New Testament, the disciples and the apostles and the believers were being persecuted for the gospel. Now, thousands of years have come and gone since then, and now we have America where few people are persecuted in a real sense. Sure, there's groups here and picket groups there and, and certain entities in politics that don't like Christians very much. And that's part of it. We can say that's part of it because it does grieve us to see the stupid policies and the words against Christians. But personally, you're not affected. Right? Personally, they're not whipping you and beating you and tossing you in jail. Does that make sense? But back then, they were. Back then, if you stood out as a Christian, you could face some serious bodily harm. Isn't that right? So today, persecution comes in the form of somebody laughed at me. My family didn't understand me. And those can be very painful, but yet pale in comparison to what the Bible people experienced. Isn't that right? Now, the way you handle it should be uh, the same or better. Since you're not getting beaten or stoned or shot at for your faith. Now, in other countries they are, and I understand that. But I'm I'm preaching in America right now, for those watching via camera. I'm preaching in America, so I'm I'm trying to explain it on, on, on your level. Does that make sense? But overseas... There are some serious persecution, lots of killings. Hundreds of thousands of Christians are killed every year in other countries. So the same stuff applies uh, even current day. All right? But Americans aren't familiar with most of this stuff, so we read it and we tie it to some uh, earth tribulation. Like, oh yeah, my car broke down type stuff. That's not what he's talking about here. Okay? Now, granted, everybody in the earth is going to experience earth tribulation. Common, uh, common earth trials. Everybody's going to have that. But the scripture when it talks about tribulations or afflictions or sufferings is not talking about uncommon tragedies in the earth. Uncommon diseases, uncommon death, uncommon accidents. That is not what the scripture is talking about when it says expect tribulation. Count it all joy my brethren when you fall into different trials and tribulations for the trying of your faith works patience. When it says that in James or other places It's talking about persecution for your faith or tribulation for your faith or this turmoil that we're going through being Christians. 
You don't have to believe it yet, but just stay tuned so we can explain these things. Because Christians have built into their belief system wrongly this idea that, yes, because we're Christians, now the devil's going to, you know, whip us. No, the devil is whipping everybody. The devil is a killer. He's a thief. He kills everybody. He, he wants everybody in the hospital. He wants everybody to be ruined. He's not just after Christians. Okay? He picks on everybody's weakness. Doesn't matter who you are. Does that make sense? So you don't have some special badge that the devil targets. I'm special, so the devil's targeting me. No, you're special, so God loves you. The devil doesn't. You don't have. The devil doesn't have to help you feel special. People have used the devil to help themselves feel special for way too long. Right? I, I must have a real call on my life because you know the devil's really been after me. No, he, he's after you and the sinner next door. And, and you go down the medical center down here. You can just. I'll prove it to you. We'll walk through the hallways, and every other person will be a sinner. You're special because the Bible says you're special. Now, let's talk about this tribulation and, and persecution here. <clears throat> Verse 5, Which is manifest evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you suffer. And basically, if you, you could reword it, and some translations have worded it a little bit better. Uh, the evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Basically, God keeps the books. Okay? So He's going to make sure the right thing happens in the end for you. He knows what you've endured. So His justice system means He is going to make sure that we are repaid accordingly. Does that make sense? And He's going to make sure that those who persecuted are going to be repaid accordingly. There is a judgment day. You know, we wish that God would kill all the sinners in our life right now. No, I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. You laugh because hopefully you don't feel that way. But did you know that when the Katrina hit New Orleans and when the tsunami hits here and there and when catastrophes happen, Christians get this weird gloating. It's because they got all that sin there, you know. I mean, have you heard? I've sensed it. You can hear it on, you can hear it on Christian TV. It's because they got, it's, I know why that happened. Or we do it on somebody. I've heard individuals do that to each other. I mean, we did it as kids. Somebody falls down on the ground, it's because you cussed earlier. And, and you know, the group of boys is over here going, ha ha, it's because you did that thing. See, we told you not to do that thing. God's getting you. And Christians do it all the time. Hopefully not these. Hopefully not us. Amen? There is a judgment day though. God's not doing that now. <clears throat> there is a judgment day though. He's going to make sure it's all ironed out in judgment day. Verse 6, Since it is, a, it is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you. Remember Paul said that about the coppersmith. Remember Alexander the coppersmith? Paul said, uh, the Lord will repay Alexander the coppersmith who did me much evil. So Paul didn't get back at him. He, he said the Lord would get back at him. He'd take care of that. So the Lord will take care of all the stuff you've been through. <clears throat> Hallelujah. But I want to talk about this tribulation for just a moment. Because everybody has probably felt a thorn at some point in their life. Isn't that true? A thorn in the flesh. Remember that term? Has anybody ever been a pain in your neck? For the gospel's sake, has anybody ever been a pain in your neck? Okay, a pain in the neck is the, is the modern way to say thorn in the flesh. Did you know that? Has anybody ever heard about the Bible thorn in the flesh that Paul had? Raise your hand if you have not heard about... No, I don't want to go there. Raise your hand if you've heard about the thorn in the flesh that Paul had. I want to go through it real fast just to make sure we're clear on what his thorn in the flesh was. I'll tell you ahead of time, his thorn in the flesh was not a disease. It was not a sickness. It was not some weird physical infirmity. His thorn in the flesh was exactly what we've been describing. It's persecution. Bothersome persecution for the gospel's sake is the thorn in the flesh. Okay? 
So denominations, uh, we won't mention any names, have, have pushed the fact that, see, you can't always be healed because, see, God didn't heal Paul. Uh, Paul had a disease and God told him no in prayer. Just make it up, all that stuff. Do we need to go? Let's go read it. 2 Corinthians 12. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 12. We'll cover two things here. One is the persecution that's real. The other is the fact that God wants everybody well. As soon as you say that, some, you know, somebody wants to stand up with a reason why God can't heal you. Why you can't fully expect God to heal you. They'll come up with the God says no. <clears throat> Here's the fallacies in the Paul. Well, let me, let, me read, let me read the setup here. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Paul's describing his journeys. He's describing uh, his preaching. He's describing the persecution that's happened to him. Just listen to what he says here. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 22. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. When he says I speak as a fool, he's, he's basically saying, I'm going to give you a human argument here. If you want to really argue on the human level, okay, well, here we go. Even though he admits it's foolish to do that, he's stepping aside out of his spirit man and saying, okay, I'll, I'll go through the flesh if you really want to. I am more, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen. How many of you want to join the ministry? <laughs> if you do feel a call to the ministry and we read these things and you're thinking, oh my gosh, oh, I could never. You're probably not called to the ministry. But if you're reading this passage, even as a Christian and thinking, I'd do it. It's no problem. I could handle it. I know I could then you might be, or it could confirm. Perils of waters, perils of robbers, perils of my own countrymen, perils of the Gentiles, perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, <clears throat> perils among false brethren. I mean, he's got troubles. Even in the church, false brethren. You ever met a false brethren? Sure you have. That's perilous. That's tribulation. In weariness and toil. I mean, you're... This could happen even in a conversation with a friend who you thought was a Christian or who proclaims to be a Christian, and you realize they're, they don't really believe like you, and they're, they're very questionable. But then they want to command you or, or argue with you. That's kind of troublesome, isn't it? Just trying to find something you can identify with. <laughs> in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, Beside the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I'm not weak? Who's made to stumble and I don't burn with indignation? If I must boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. Stop there. You see that? He calls all this his infirmity. If he's going to boast, here, I'll, I'll, I'll boast, but not about me. I'm going to boast about the stuff I've encountered for the gospel's sake. Make sense? And he calls that his infirmity. Now, some people stop there and say, well, actually, they didn't read the whole thing. They just ignore all that passage and say, see, he had an infirmity. And to an American, infirmity means a sickness, doesn't it? But to him, no, his thorn in the flesh was all this stuff. Now, here's the next chapter, and here are the fallacies about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Number one, it says, no, the first fallacy is that Paul was in pride. That's wrong. We'll disprove that. Number two says no one knows what Paul's thorn was. And I guarantee we can prove what it was. We can know exactly what the thorn in the flesh was. Number three, the fallacy is that God wouldn't do anything about it. That's wrong. And number four is that God gave Paul the thorn in the flesh. Now, if you never studied this out for yourself, at some point in your Christianity, you've probably heard some of these things. That God gave Paul a thorn in the, the flesh to keep him hum humble, etc., etc. Let's disprove all that real fast. It won't take us long. <clears throat> Basically, if you can read, you can figure it out. 
chapter 12, verse 1. Paul says, it is doubtless not profitable for me to... And the reason we're doing this, sorry. The reason we're doing this is to distinguish between Bible tribulation and persecution versus what people have thought was tribulation and persecution. I'm saying New Testament tribulation and persecution is always about the gospel attack or the attack against the gospel. Rather than tribulation being sickness, disease, and all these things that Christians can expect to have. I say Christians don't have to expect those things. We're exempted from those things by covenant. And we have scripture on that. So we can't confuse the two and crisscross tribulation into persecution or sickness and disease. Make sense? Chapter 12, verse 1. It's doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which is not lawful for a man to utter. Stop there. Paul speaking of himself, most scholars agree on that. And he's just saying, I don't know if I was in the body or out of the body. I don't know if, it was, if I was there in a vision or if I was physically there. I was in the third heaven and I heard a lot of good stuff. Okay, that's basically what he's saying. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. What infirmities? We just read it in chapter 11, didn't we? For, I, for though I might desire to boast... I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. Notice what he says here. He's concerned about how people are going to take this. If he goes around saying, hey, I went up to the third heaven, he's concerned about that. Does that make sense? Yeah. He's not boasting about that, so he's not in pride. You can tell he's already caring. And he didn't want anybody to think of him above that which they should. Verse 7, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations. Stop there. Notice, again, he's concerned about being exalted above measure. By whom? Is he worried about self-exaltation? Or is he worried about people exalting him? people. He's already said, I'm concerned that you don't think of me too highly above. Here he says, I don't want to be exalted above. Same thing, right? He's concerned about people thinking too highly of him. Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Stop there for a second. Let's go back up here. Notice, so that he was not exalted too highly, and we've agreed that it's among the people's sake, right? A thorn in the flesh was given to me. Notice it doesn't say God gave him the thorn in the flesh. It says a thorn was given to me. Why? So that he wouldn't be exalted in the people's eyes too much. Does that make sense? If Paul was being prideful and exalting himself, certainly the devil would not have given him a thorn. Let's let's answer that one before before I explain that. So that he wasn't exalted above measure, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. So this was a messenger of Satan, or we could say a messenger from Satan. So where did the thorn in the flesh come from? The thorn in the flesh was a messenger of or from Satan. So who gave the thorn in the flesh? Who gave the thorn in the flesh? It was a messenger from whom? From God? It's from Satan. Now, the word messenger is a little blind to us. In the Greek here, and in everywhere else in the New Testament, the word messenger is the Greek word agelos, A-G-G-E-L-O-S, which refers to angel. Okay? Matter of fact, if you turn back one page to 2 Corinthians 11, it says, 
verse 14, And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That word angel is the same word, a jealous. And so over here, an angel of Satan was given to buffet him. Now what is an angel of Satan? That'd be a demon. A demon was given to buffet. Where do demons come from? They don't come from God. So God didn't give Paul the thorn in the flesh. The devil gave Paul the thorn in the flesh. To buffet him. The word buffet means to strike with an with a open or closed fist. That's what buffet means. To whip, to beat. Which is exactly what we read in 2 Corinthians 11. The thorn was given to beat him up. To whip him, to stone him, to try to kill him. So basically the devil sent demon, a, a demon, a special demon. He might have had you know, more soldiers with him. To persecute Paul, to whip him, to stop the gospel to put Paul lower so that he wouldn't be too highly exalted in front of too many people. The more revelation he got, the more influence he got, Satan wanted to stop that from happening. Does that make sense? So that's why the devil sent the thorn in the flesh. We know it came from the devil. If Paul was getting into pride, would the devil have tried to stop that? No, if Paul was getting into pride, the devil would be feeling pretty good about it. Because the devil knows pride goes before the fall. So if Paul was really getting into pride, the devil wouldn't have got involved here. He'd have let Paul fall on his own. But it wasn't pride. Paul was getting exalted in front of the people, so the devil wanted to put that down. So he sent the thorn in the flesh to persecute. Make sense? So Paul was not in pride, we proved that. The second fallacy was no one knows what the thorn was. Well, some people say, see, it says thorn in the flesh. So they think, see, there it's in his flesh. See, it's some, some sickness in his flesh. They've tried to figure out that Paul had an eye disease, a foot fungus, all sorts of things. <laughs> Where did they get that from? Well, I don't, I don't know exactly. The one thing that one scripture Paul wrote, he said, I've written a large letter with my own hand. They said, see, he, he couldn't see well, so he had to write large letters. <laughs> You've heard it, haven't you? How many of you have heard that before? Yep. Paul had an eye problem. <laughs> Just a bunch of guesswork. The truth is we don't have to guess because we know exactly what the thorn was. Amen. You know, it's a colloquial. Thorn in the flesh is a colloquialism that the Israelites, that they used in the Old Testament for the Israelites. When the Israelites was encompassed around about by their enemies, it was the thorn in their flesh. God said this, if you don't obey me, then you'll be cursed and, and they'll become all these, the Ammonites and the Hittites and all these guys will become thorns in your sides, thorns in your flesh. It's always referring to people. It's always referring to those who have come against you. That's the term for thorn in the flesh. Or we could just compare it to American colloquialism, pain in the neck. You ever watch basketball or football or any sport and one team just can't seem to beat the other team. Every season they just keep getting whipped by this one team and that's their thorn in the flesh. Or one player on the team keeps whipping them. And they say, he's the thorn in their flesh. He's the thorn in my side. You ever had a pain in the neck? It didn't mean you had a physical pain in the neck. That part, they're just a pain in my neck. It not mean you're physically hurt. So can we agree that the thorn... Was people persecuting Paul everywhere he went? Yeah. Verse 8. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, no. Does the scripture say no? People said God said no. Paul wanted to be... They say he wanted to be healed. I say that's not healing. Paul asked, he asked something from God. God did not say no to him. What did God say? God said, my grace is sufficient for you. Meaning I've already given you a tool. I've given you a tool for my strengths made perfect, perfect in weakness. We know you got weakness, but I've given you grace. God never said no. Now, we don't know exactly what he's referring to. Either grace to endure through it. Since persecution, you have to realize this, persecution is the one 
form of suffering Jesus said we would have. Anyone who lives godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. He never said anybody who lives godly in Christ Jesus will be attacked by Satan extra with extra diseases. No, sickness and disease is an enemy and we are redeemed from it. Jesus showed us the will of God in this manner. Jesus showed us how to avoid persecution until our call is fulfilled. So you can do that. And that's what he's telling Paul. I've given you grace to endure through this. And Paul escaped persecution many times. Paul escaped. Remember they led him down the wall? People there to kill him, they led him down the wall. He escaped. I want to escape persecution too if I can. Right? I'm never going to show up to somebody and say, here, try it, hit me. (laughs) I'm going to escape out of that mess. Jesus escaped persecution. Remember he just was translated through a crowd. They're about to throw him off the cliff. He just translated right through the crowd and just departed from them. His, it wasn't his time. That's right. So either God is saying, Paul, I've given you grace to endure through this persecution. Or I've given you grace to, to stop this demon from harassing you. Now it's possible that it could have been that demon. Remember that demon that stirred up the lady at Philippi? The, the fortune telling lady that walked around following them for many days crying, These are the servants of the Most High God. Hear ye them. And the Bible says, And Paul, after many days, turned to the Spirit and said, Come out in the name of Jesus. Remember that? Then he got put in prison for it. That could have been the moment where he used the grace of God. Now, I'm not saying that for sure, but the timetable, it, it could be. So he could, he, he did deal with a demon that was harassing him, didn't he? So it's possible, that because the, the grace of God means ability. The grace of God means power and ability. It means favor. It means a lot of things. So when when God said my grace is sufficient, it means either I've given you enough ability to handle this or enough ability to thwart it. To put up with it or to thwart it, one of the two. Maybe you're getting harassed at work. Maybe there's some family members. Well, seek the Lord. See what you need to do. Number one, don't get in the flesh about it. Don't get emotional about any persecution or tribulation or friction between people. Either deal with it spiritually and command the demon to stop his operation in those people because that's what the demon does. The demon doesn't do it invisibly. He does it by stirring up people. So don't think that demons, when you're doing something for the Lord, that part of the persecution is a demon affecting your body physically. Don't go there. You can be delivered from that, no problem. You can come, he, Jesus said, in my name you'll cast out devils. So my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities. What's his infirmities? Not sickness and disease. Not cancer and arthritis. That the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Notice he didn't mention sickness in there. Paul was not dealing with sickness. I've become a fool in boasting. You've compelled me. Well, we'll stop there. That's good enough. Does that make sense? So I think we've disproved everything. God didn't give him the thorn, that's for sure. He wasn't in pride. No, and we do know what his thorn was. And God did do something about it. Does that make sense? So we can't use Paul's thorn as a sacred cow to hide behind when prayers don't go answered. When prayer seems unanswered, don't use Paul's thorn and don't use Job. Well, you know, Job suffered. And then after you've disproved the Paul's thorn fallacy and you disprove Job's predicament, Job was a man without a savior. Job had nothing. So Christians can't compare themselves to Job. Job had nothing you have. He had no blood of Jesus. He had no Holy Spirit. He had no name of Jesus. He had no word of God. Job had no covenant. Job had no savior. Job had no Holy Spirit. Job didn't know anything that you know. He didn't have any authority over the devil. He didn't even know it was a devil. Amen. How can you whip the enemy if you don't know what he is? And yet he still endured and trusted God enough to get delivered within the year. Hallelujah. 
with, with almost zero knowledge, Job got a miracle. So if you're going to compare yourself to Job, get a miracle. <laughs> People have wanted to be the suffering Job for so long, it's just ruined them. Some prayer gets delayed for a few months. I guess I'm like, poor old Job, you know, he suffered. Don't do that. Jesus came for you. Amen. Amen. Don't disrespect the cross. Hallelujah. But just when you disprove the, the, the Paul's thorn fallacy, you disprove the Job fallacy, then someone brings up some other obscure thing in the Bible. Turn with me to Philippians. I'll show you one of them. Somebody will find one person in the Bible that didn't get healed somewhere and say, See there, see there, see there. All I need is one person who did get healed in the Bible. See there, see there, see there. I want to be the guy that got it, not the guy that didn't. But people, if you haven't realized yet, they'll fight to stay sick and broke. They'll fight tooth and nail to stay unhappy and depressed, won't they? Fight tooth and nail to complain and grumble and mumble all day rather than rejoice and be happy all day. Why is that? It's the fallen nature. We have a sin nature, a fallen nature. It's dumb. It doesn't act right. It's dumb. And you have to recognize the sin nature will drag you down. The sin nature is a grumbler, a complainer, a judger, a putter downer, a negative person. The sin nature is very, very negative. <clears throat> Where are we here? Paul's uh, preaching here, he, or writing here. He says, Yet I, I considered it. Oh, I'm sorry, Philippians 2, verse 24. I trust in the Lord that I myself also shall come shortly. Yet I considered it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need. Since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost to death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Somebody stops there and says, see there, see there. Look, Epaphroditus, he's a preacher. And look, he's sick. Hey, look, I'm not saying sickness and disease doesn't exist. I'm not saying that Christians don't encounter sickness and disease. I'm not saying that preachers don't encounter sickness and disease. You're not exempt from sickness and disease just because you're a Christian. You, you could be exempted from sickness and disease if you believed the truth and understood authority over sickness and disease. But you're not automatically exempted. And you're not automatically automatically exempted just because you're a good Christian. Well, they're such a good Christian. How could it happen to a good Christian? Because being good doesn't exempt you from anything. Job was a good man and an upright man. The best in all the East. One of the lessons of Job is that being good and upright doesn't promise you freedom from destruction. Now, it's better than being bad and disfigured. But being good, good and upright is not, is not the, the method of healing. The method of healing is the name of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. It's the covenant of God. It's the redemption. The method of, of healing is, is faith in the Word of God. Faith in the Lord. Faith in Christ. Faith in the name of Jesus has made the man strong. That's the way to get healed. So, 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 what does this mean? Well, it means people get sick. There's no doubt about that. But don't stop there. Notice it says God had mercy on him. See, for any believer who trusts God, God will have mercy on you. And that's one thing you can cry out for, not just to get your sins forgiven, but when you have a sickness or a disease or something that's stopping you from working, God have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. This is a big deal for me. Have, have mercy and compassion on me. I know you do, Father. I receive that mercy and compassion now. If you read the Bible, you'll see every time Jesus had compassion, He healed them. Is He merciful? Yes, He is. And that part of mercy is healing. And Jesus had compassion and healed their eyes. And Jesus had compassion and fed the multitude. And Jesus had compassion and raised the dead person out of the casket. Hallelujah. 
But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. So you, you get sorrowful when somebody's sick, almost dying. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I, I may be less sorrowful. Paul's just talking like a real Christian, isn't he? Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Ah, because for the work of Christ he came close to death not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service toward me. Now it even tells you why he was sick. He was neglecting himself. You ever done that before? Sure you have. Half the sicknesses, half the sicknesses are a result of not getting enough sleep, enough rest, too much stress, not enough water. It's the truth. Epaphroditus was, not, was close to death because for the work. Back then, the work was a lot harder. You didn't just hop on a plane that had, you know, nice water bottles given to you and refreshments. And Back then, you had to travel. So he was traveling to, to serve Paul for the work he was sick. And even God healed that. Even self-neglect, God healed, had mercy on him. Some people think, well, I put myself in this place, so God can't really help me. No, that's not true. Some people have lung cancer from smoking cigarettes. They think, well, see, I did it to myself. I can't really have any faith. No, you might have been kind of ignorant about it and done something to yourself. But let's go ahead and get some mercy from God and, and get healed from that. Amen. God forgets the past anyway. That's good news for any of you smokers, isn't it? Should I pick on the smokers? No, I won't pick on the smokers. No, but you ought to get healed and you ought to get delivered. Amen. Amen. The grace of God is sufficient for you. Amen. So, anyway, that's, there's, there's no issue here. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. Yeah, Epaphroditus, a preacher, got sick. Well, preachers get sick sometimes. It doesn't, doesn't refute the healing doctrine. Amen. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online, by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. To watch services via live streaming or for more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web or download our Houston Faith phone app or catch our Houston Faith TV Roku channel.